Julie Gunlock from the Independent Women's Forum is with us at the uh, Mothership this afternoon. How are you, Julie? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on. My pleasure, as always. So we've been talking a lot about school lunches and school breakfasts and school dinners. How long before the school midnight snack program, <laughs> by the way? Pretty soon, houses are no longer going to contain kitchens because kids can now get three square meals at school. So, yeah. I just um, think, you know, soon they'll just move the kids into school, right? They'll just have dorms. That way, if the kids, <laughs> listen, if, so, if if Junior gets hungry at 1130 at night, we want to make sure that he can be provided for with a healthy lettuce wrap. So we just, we got to move him into the school. I got to tell you, there are some days where I would not object to that. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> I guess from a policy perspective, um, that would not be a You're part of the problem, Julie Gunlock. <laughs> oh, Take him. See, you're part of the problem. <laughs> <laughs> uh, listen and listen. You get I, just just on a personal note. You got to change that attitude. It's only March, <laughs> Julie. It's only March. We're not even to summer vacation yet. Oh, we're not even to spring break in my school district. So yeah, I um I need to I, know. I need to get a hold of myself at least when I'm on the radio. <laughs> That's I, right. When I'm publicly speaking, <laughs> <laughs> I hope they never see this video. <laughs> Uh, anyway, one day, one day, one day you'll uh, you'll I'll miss share. them. No, I, listen, I've I, heard I'll miss them someday. <laughs> Kids are a rare joy. It's it's it, it can only be you know it's it's kind of like, never mind. I'm not even right. Let's go there. let's move on. Anyway, let's talk about <laughs> yeah. Let's let's move on. Let's talk about school lunches. Let's get back to that. Yeah. Um, so there's a bill out there that would provide for more flexibility in school lunches, right? As opposed right. to what we have right now, where you have kids complain that. You know, look, I'm on the football team, or I'm 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 cheerleading. I, I I'm very active. I need more to eat. I'm yeah. starving. Yeah, yeah. The feds have have limited calories. They've limited what can go on the tray. They've limited what toppings can go on food. They've limited you know salt and and all sorts of of things um, that the school lunch ladies and men um, can put on the food. So they they've the federal control over how people actually cook the food in the schools is has never been this tight. I mean, people really have trouble making this food taste good. And and again, you know what what this bill will do is it'll relieve some of that tension and it will give locals um, the control they need. I mean, one great example of this is you've got a 105 pound cheerleader standing next to a 300 pound linebacker, and they both are required to get the same number of calories or something like 850 calories for a certain age group, the high school students, um, and they can't get seconds. And the, 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 the 105 pound cheerleader, you know, she can't ask for less food. They've got to put the same amount of food. I mean, this is, this is this sort of, you know, uh, you know, weird sort of, you have no choices, uh, kind of programs that we see from the big federal government. And it's at work here in, in the schools. And then, you know, some of the parents, uh, particularly kids who play sports, I mean, you, you've said that your son is, is playing more sports, you know, you know, at scrimmages after school or at practice, they can burn through 500 calories in, you know, two plays. And so they really need those extra calories and they're just not able to get it. Add to that, that they've now taken out sort of the snacks that kids like to eat out of the vending machines and replaced them with all this health food. Um, again, it's really hard to get the calories. It's all this sort of low calorie, low fat food in the vending machines, making it harder for the kids to supplement. And some of them don't even like the food. So again, you know, my theory on this has been that Michelle Obama, you know, she, she goes into the White House and her whole theory is I'm going to make kids eat more nutritiously. I want them to, you know, really understand what fruits and vegetables are and healthy food. What she's done is further strengthen the relationship between between school kids and McDonald's and 7-Elevens because they starve themselves until they can exit that building and then they head straight for, you know, whatever food place where they can get their fix. Yeah, you know, and it's really interesting. Um, looking at uh, some of the news stories on this, uh, Representative Noam says, uh, you look at areas where we have high poverty in South Dakota. She says, these kids go home from school. They get no food until they come back and have breakfast the next morning. You have school nutrition specialists and lunch personnel in tears that they cannot give these kids seconds so that they can have some in their pocket for later on in the day or get through to the next morning, uh, which is an interesting, uh, you know, argument that, uh, you know, we're, we're talking about, and a lot of the discussion focuses on uh, obese kids, 
But here's Representative Noam saying, look, you know, we'd like some of these some of these school nutrition uh, would like to have these kids have more food. Yeah, uh, I, they may need more food. Again, there's not a one size right. fits all policy that we're talking about here. And, and Representative, uh, excuse me, uh, Ag Secretary Vilsack, uh, according to the uh, South Dakota Public Broadcasting uh, <laughs> uh, uh, Program, uh, says that meals in schools can't cater to individual students but provide a standard meal that meets nutritional needs. He says that the uh, standards now allow room for schools to adjust their meal plans. He says, quote, Julie, we're not putting them in a straitjacket. Uh, there is some ability to adjust, so I think it's probably not quite accurate to suggest that school districts don't have any flexibility <laughs> and it's one size fits all. But yet we have these school districts complaining to the contrary, and, and the, the agriculture secretary is basically saying, Puh, they're lying. Yeah, no, I agree. And look, I'm really glad that that the the congresswoman has has introduced this legislation. I want to though back up though on something that she said that really kind of bothers me. You know, her her point is, um, you know, you know, school school nutrition advisors they're they're crying. They can't provide kids um, with enough food. They they come back in the morning and they're starving. I mean, there's sort of a burying the lead here issue. I mean, the fact that. Do these kids go home and no? Do, does, do their parents not feed them? And in fact, that is what she's saying. She's saying that these children, every single nutritional requirement and need is coming from the school. I mean, that to me seems like a bigger issue. I wish that we would see. I mean, I understand that the congresswoman is trying to add flexibility and give sort of the power back to the local officials. And I 100 percent agree with that. But sometimes I hear this narrative about kids coming to school and nobody's fed them in the past 12 hours. And I, I mean, this seems like a huge story. I mean, do we have an epic, you know, problem with ch parent neglect here? Um, and I wish that there was more talk about that. I mean, I wish some leaders in Washington would talk about why are parents so willing to give up this responsibility to the government? Why are, is there a huge group of parents out there who apparently don't feel any responsibility to feeding their children? Um, we need that discussion as well. I mean, I understand that there may be a need to feed kids at school and schools are doing their best to feed that, but ultimately schools are supposed to be educational institutions, correct? So I think we need to also have this discussion of why parents are so willing. And part of that maybe is that the government uh, simply is encouraging parents to, to give, that, give up that responsibility and just, hey, all your food needs can be uh, you know, can be uh, fulfilled at this at your school. I'm telling you, and see, now we're back to the midnight snacks. You know, <laughs> and and boarding school, boarding right. school for uh, for for all. Yeah, right? boarding school for all, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Pretty soon, it's a listen. If edu right, sure. I, well, that, <laughs> listen, we'll 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 pick that up. Uh, probably in July, midpoint summer vacation, when you really need, uh, you know, something to think about. Then we'll reintroduce the idea of boarding school for all. Okay. Well, I mean, don't, but in I, the I, meantime, I, I will say just really quickly about school, about summer. There are programs already in existence where a child can get a meal during summer break, um, and I, I believe two Congress, maybe it was House members, introduced a bill couple years ago to actually provide meals during holidays. Um, so summer break is not, school is not, the school restaurant is not closed during summer break. That is a, uh, no, that's a very good point. You're yeah. right. I, I mean, I suppose the classrooms are open too for summer school sometimes and yeah. things like that. But, but, but every day. You're, I mean, you remember when it was New York City, right? During one of the blizzards, that was, school was closed. But the cafeterias were open. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's a sad state of affairs. It's All just right. so sad. See, it's not really about the education. I'm telling you. It's about, it's, it's, it's basically the golden corral with, uh, with chalkboards. <laughs> yes, exactly. That's, uh, that's exactly. Actually, it's not even golden yeah. corral because that's all you can eat. <laughs> right. It's that's not true. golden corral. And if it was yes. golden corral, maybe. Maybe that should be, Julie, your vision going forward no. of our public education system. <laughs> Golden Corral with chalkboards. It's going Let more and more in that direction. As as they want. Yes, indeed it is. But that is not my vision. No. That's my nightmare. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> 
All right, let's talk about your piece, uh, Nudge Theory at Work at uh, IWF.org. Sort of a, a compendium of recent nudges that, uh, that you may not have noticed in the, uh, in the headlines because they really weren't headline stories. Yeah, I mean, you've got everything from, like I said, the you know the school lunch program, the ex, ex, um, ex, continued expansion of the school lunch program. Um, the EPA wants to monitor your grill. The EPA wants to monitor your shower head. Um, health um, interventionists coming into your workplace. Um, text messages from some government bureaucrat telling you you've eaten too much. Um, just a number of policies out <laughs> there um, that are really creepy. I mean, you know, we have the new dietary guidelines telling people to lay off meat, um, except a, a, a vegetarian diet, not because that's good for you, but because we want to save the earth and all be like, you know, Al Gore and, um, you know, and, and sort of do what's right for the planet. Again, having nothing to do with health, even though the dietary guidelines are, are, are charged by Congress only to consider nutrition data and nutrition science, but they went beyond their scope um, and decided to turn this into um, some sort of environmental panel. Um, so again, you've got all these sort of um, new government initiatives to sort of nudge you into good behavior. And if you don't behave the way the government um deems appropriate, um, someone will show up at your workplace. Um, maybe you'll get a bill for using too much water um, while taking a shower. Maybe you'll be told you're not grilling in the correct way. Um, people showing up to your school, to your child's school, to talk to them about their eating habits, and maybe the parents uh, won't be told. I mean, these are the kinds of things that are... Um, you know, it, it's it's really creepy. It's it's a nicer form of re-education, um, and I think Americans need to be aware of these things. Um, this is all part of nudge theory. We've talked about this before. It's sort of nudging you. Some people like to say shoving you, but it's nudging you in a direction the government wants to see you behave. It, yeah, it absolutely is. And and you know what's interesting is as you talk about some of these things. Uh, and this is maybe something, you know, to get into uh, in greater detail uh, at, at another time as well. But it strikes me that, you know, there's there's this intersection of technology uh, and and the nudginess uh, where, you know, you're getting the text messages. Uh, a few years ago, I think it was uh, when Michael Bloomberg was mayor of New York, his health department would send you a letter uh, letting you know that, uh, that they had seen your test results from your last physical and, hey, uh, you were a little overweight. Now, you know, you don't get the, the letter in the mail. Now it's the text message uh, that maybe you sign up for, or maybe it's just a free service uh, yeah. as part of your insurance. You know, and with, with the advent of things like the, uh, uh, the, the, A, the Internet of Things, right? So you've got the monitor. One of your stories was about, you know, the government monitoring uh, uh, computer uh, TV usage. Yeah. Uh, you know, you, you've you got everything from your smart thermostat to your smart refrigerator, to your now smart watch that can monitor all these things that allows that intrusion, it does. right? I mean, you, yep. may, you may willingly be giving up this information and this data uh, uh, to some company, but there are social justice warriors, there are progressives, whatever label you want to call them, who want to use that open door to pry into every single last facet of your life. Yeah, and you know, what's so frustrating is that there are actually a lot of private industries that are doing this kind of stuff, but they offer rewards. And that really does seem to work better. My husband, actually, at his office, if he got, uh, I think he had to do a million steps in a year, um, and he, you know, he, he sort of reached that goal, and he got a certain um, percentage off his health insurance premiums. Um, uh, mm -hmm. You know, we've actually, my I, my husband and I have done a couple surveys and, um, and uh, online with his his company and for for doing that survey we got a little bit off um we're doing things that um that we know add to our health and and lower our bottom line and again that's an that's an incentive program and it's privately run i but mean what about but see that's the thing i mean can't you see a public education system los angeles for instance uh you know every kid got an ipad yeah. I think that that was their goal. Every kid gets an iPad. All right. Well, what if the Department of Education says, what's the fattest school district in America? What is the percentage of the most obese students in this country? Every kid gets a, a Fitbit. 
and, and we're going to monitor these kids' uh, uh, exercise activities. We're going to ensure that when they're at school, they're you know taking the long way to uh, their different right. classes. I, I mean, is that not two? What is that? Two years away? Are we two yeah, years away th from that? Yeah. Oh, we're we're already seeing that. Actually, there's uh, there's already some school districts that have offered that kind of stuff. But but I think um, I think what people need to realize is that you know there needs to people need to understand the proper role of certain entities. I mean, that is not the school district's role. It's mm -hmm. not the government's role. It's parents' role at that point. Parents need to do this. My husband's employer, my husband doesn't have to work there. He can quit if he thinks it's too intrusive. Um, and so, again, you have this sort of this misunderstanding. Some people say, oh, but it's for the kids, right? It's for the kids and, oh, this is for the health of people or, oh, this will this will reduce the the, um, the incidence of obesity. I mean, you've got a story out this week where the L.A. County put in certain bans in certain zoned areas where obesity was high, so they couldn't put uh, fast food restaurants in there. And now the results are in. Two yep. years later, obesity has gone up, okay? And you know what? But you know what went down? Unemploy or unemployment went down. Or unemployment increased in those areas because you took away low-skilled jobs for people who need those jobs. And so, I mean, these are this is what this kind of social programming does. It has these unintended consequences that ultimately hurt people, hurt the very people, for instance, in poor areas who knew who need these jobs. Absolutely. Absolutely. Listen, Julie, uh, a real pleasure catching up with you this week. I could talk about this stuff forever and ever, but uh, <laughs> I know that you've got to get back to your day and we've got to get back to the uh, 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 the other segments of the show, but I hope you have a, a fantastic week, and hopefully I get to see you in person soon. I got to go pick up the kids, so maybe can we talk longer? No, I'm kidding. I, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for no. having me on. <laughs> go. Go put on your mom hat. We'll talk to you soon. All right, thanks. Julie Gunlock from the Independent Women's Forum in studio with us. You're right here on NRA News, Cam and Company.